a powerful prison boss, vanishes in the Victorian high country. Did he die? Did he leave? Was he shot? But no trace has ever been found of David Prudeau. Things can disappear into this country very, very easily. Yes, yeah, something's not right here. Is his disappearance linked to the murder of crime boss Carl Williams? Who is obstructing our journey to find the truth? Adam Shand investigates. Do you think he was murdered? Yes. And finds a family torn apart. I don't believe those, those rumours. They're actually true. Are they? That is a tragedy. I'm in Mansfield in the Victorian high country. It's a gateway town for hikers, campers and hunters who venture into the surrounding Alpine National Park. That's what David Prideau had on his mind when he came to Mansfield on June 4, 2011. He knew this area well, but this was to be his last trip into the mountains. My name's Steve Prideau and I'm David's uh, younger brother. We're very close, we're only five years apart, so we uh, grew up together, went to school together, spent a lot of time together, and then as a, as a young married bloke, we uh, sort of bought our first house in the same suburb as David, and we ultimately lived four doors apart. Had uh, daughters at the same time, sons at the same time, so we were really good mates as well. There were nine children in the Prado family, and they were all very close. Stephen went into IT. David rose rapidly through the ranks of prison administration. By 2011, he was at the top of his game, appointed general manager of the toughest prison in Victoria, Barwon. In June 2011, David went on a deer hunting trip with his brother-in-law, Rob Dale. Rob was married to David's sister, Janine. David and Rob were heading into the Victorian high country, in particular, the Buckland Spur. That's where I'm driving now. They'd travelled there many times before on shooting trips and motorcycle adventures. Today I'm meeting Alex Christich at the Spur. Alex is a former Victorian policeman and he's worked with me on the disappearance of David Prideau. G'day, mate. How are you? Good, mate. How's yourself? Yeah, excellent. Thank you. Good to see you. Did you have a good yeah. drive up? Not bad at all. It's a beautiful day. It's a bit warmer than when David Prado was here. It would have been a lot cooler when he was here. Yeah, sure. definitely. Well, let's have a look around, shall we? Yeah, for sure. Let's go. It was no accident that David and Rob scheduled their hunting trip for winter. Winter is the ideal time to actually hunt samba deer, which are the deer that you normally see in this area. So as a stalker in particular, you can move through the bush fairly quietly without attracting attention to yourself and without stirring the animals up. David and Rob didn't go hunting as soon as they arrived. It was late in the day, so they spent the night at Tomahawk Hut, a landmark in the Buckland Spur. The cattlemen put these huts here back in the mid-1800s. Yeah, this one's 1927, so it's a later one. And there's a pretty steady traffic of people up here because the logbook is still here. And when, it is. when I came back up here eight years ago, his name was still in there. There's a lot of people come through since. This is just from 2019. David Prado's entry from June 4, 2011, 
shows that he and Rob stayed there that night. What did he say? Uh, you know, thanks to you know, Hutz Victoria or, or something like that. It was a little throwaway line. So we know he was there, but everything after that point makes no sense at all. At 7.45 a.m. after making breakfast, Rob Dale and David Prado left Tomahawk Hut. Rob would later tell police they walked a short distance along the Buckland Spur track to a fork in the road where they parted company. Rob Dale told the police that David took the trail along the escarpment. Rob said that he went the other way over the saddle. The plan was to circle the mountain scouting for deer and then to meet back at the hut for lunch. David was well equipped. He carried a backpack containing food, water, a UHF radio, compass, binoculars and a space blanket if the weather turned nasty. He was wearing camo gear and had a high-vis orange beanie. These deer don't run away straight away when you're in the area. They'll stand still. And they'll wait till they think they've been compromised and then they'll move off. Many a time I've walked within, within two or three metres of them and they explode out of the bush and take off, you know. Your best chance of getting a shot is as if you're standing on the game trail. Right. If you move off the trail, you're going to have bushes and trees and things in the way. If David did move off the game trail in pursuit of deer, it would have been very easy for him to lose his bearings in the wilderness. You could walk 100 metres into that bush. I'm not going to see. No way. You know, I'd have to get on my hands and knees and look for where you've been to be able to identify where you've been. Particularly that time of year. Of course. Yeah. yeah. David and Rob had made plans to meet back at Tomahawk Hut at lunchtime on the 5th. What time did Robbie get back? He got back about 11 o'clock and David obviously did it. Paul Prado is another one of David's brothers. The appointed time for David's return passes, 12, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock. What did Robbie do in those hours? Um, he just sort of potted around the camp, strolled up and down uh, the track a bit, made coffee, um, got a bit of firewood, and just waited patiently. Rob Dale didn't call the police until after 6 p.m. By the time they arrived, it was dark more than 12 hours since the two hunters had split up on the trail. What happens then? They've asked Rob to fire his gun. By then the weather had started to turn, it was a miserable night, and they just realised the futility in trying to do anything any further that night, so they thought they'd better go back and organise this properly, and they did. A wide-scale land and air search has been conducted for 50-year-old David Prudeau, who is the general manager of Barwon Prison. Police, as well as bush search and rescue teams, made a base at Tomahawk Hut. They assigned groups to search bushland either side of the Buckland Spur track where David was last seen. What was that mood on that first day of searching? Optimism, um, we will find him. Um, we will find him. How big was the initial search area? Uh, they say 300 square metres, and it probably was, but I would have thought it would be actually about out to about six or 700 square metres in every possible direction. That's not much bigger than a football field. I understand what you're saying, but when you look at the country and when you look at the conditions, little ravines, big ravines, erosion marks, wombat holes, hollow logs, there were so many places where a person could have slipped or been injured. They were fabulous and it was just a genuine, genuine effort.
Day three of the search for David Prideau has been hampered by bad weather. The mood quickly changed with the arrival of snow on the mountain. Snow came down, it was a blizzard, and you had to probe with sticks and everything. So suddenly you're walking across false ground, as it were. Oh, yeah, you wouldn't, you'd, you'd fall into holes and you'd fall between logs and anything could happen. A lot of this scrub here, once it's laden with snow, it'll, it leans over and effectively blankets what's underneath it. So it's quite possible the searchers could have walked over David Prideau's body and not known. Of course, of course, of course it's possible. The conditions are going to be deteriorating with uh, more snow expected and more wind and obviously low clouds. So unfortunately the helicopter's grounded at the moment because of that, but we've got it standing by waiting for a break. When the break in the weather eventually came, momentum was gone. The search was scaled back and then abandoned. A heartbreaking decision for the family, especially for David's wife, Joanne. Joanne, what sort of husband and person is David? The best, the best, the best, the best. The family vowed to return to the search area in spring. But as they left the mountain, Brothers Paul and Stephen were already having dark thoughts about the fate of their brother. At what point did you think that there could be misadventure or foul play? Probably about day three when we were not getting the results and two people come to me and say, he's not here. Do you think he was murdered? Yes. And it will be proven. It's obvious that things aren't right. It's obvious that uh, bad things have happened. The narrative is he went for a short walk and we know he's not there. So therefore, the story that starts the whole journey cannot be right. Coming up, the Carl Williams connection. The very same material that got Carl Williams killed was in David's car. Yes. At what point was that discovered? Well, it wasn't discovered in the car at all. When a high country search for Victorian prison boss David Prideau was abandoned in 2011, his brothers Stephen and Paul were not satisfied. Nothing was making sense. There was no body and none of David's belongings had been recovered. They were determined never to give up the search. And while they waited for the winter to end, they made sure that David was not forgotten. A prison manager believed to have perished in the Victorian Alps has been remembered as a family man with an adventurous spirit. A month after David's disappearance, a memorial service attracted 1,300 people. There were prison warders, emergency workers, footy mates and family, keen to share happy memories. I looked in his esky. It was full of exotic cheese, sun-dried tomatoes, olives, fine wine, a variety of casseroles and a couple of different Thai soups. He certainly liked to rough it with style. I've never seen a funeral so big with no body. Rick Tisdale went to school with Stephen and got to know the entire Prideaux clan well. What was the family like? The family was actually very close and very loving. If you went away with one, they all come along. You've seen David Prideaux under pressure. You were travelling with the brothers when you got lost in the high country. Well, it was actually a day we... Actually, all the families went up. We went uh, camping at the Bluff Hut up at the back of Mount Buller there, and we hopped on a motorbike. It was a bit like going out on the SS Minnow with Gilligan and Professor and Skipper. I was the only one with a drink bottle because it was only a three-hour tour. 
We went down hills, across rivers. It was 40 degrees. We filled up in the rivers and uh, drunk out of puddles up on the, the ridges, which you could be you know, riding along for you know, an hour, two hours. And then you finally look at somebody's map and you go, oh, this is how we've got to get home. Well, you know, we finally crawled home at about 5 o'clock in the morning. Did you think of that moment later when you heard he disappeared? Oh, very much so. You think of, you know, great moments like that where, you know, being in a challenging position, we worked together. We solved our problem, we got back. And David being a leading member in that moment, resourceful, able, optimistic. Yep, and fit. So the fact that he would disappear is a mystery, isn't it? Very much so. David's the sort of bloke who would have crawled out of anywhere with two broken legs and found his way home. He was not a, not a guy who'd just sort of curl up in a ball and, and give up on life. It's just that not him at all. In 2011, when the snow melted after another harsh winter, the search for David Prido resumed. But again, nothing turned up. It was at this point a split began to open in the Prideaux family. Stephen and Paul did not accept that David had been somehow swallowed up by the wilderness. That was the view of their sister Janine and brother Peter. Their differences came to a head over a plaque erected at Tomahawk Hut in the memory of David. I'd come up with a concept we should put together a plaque and my sister said, oh, look, I'd like that responsibility to take that on. I said, I don't care who does it. It's just something that needs to be done. And of course, I was living in South East Queensland, so I was keen to bring the family down so we could actually all get together and bond and sort of pay our respects. And I kept getting dismissed that, oh, look, there's nothing happening yet and we haven't made a plan yet. And it basically got to the day and I was home in Queensland when I you know, got a phone call from Paul that, you know, that there were family members up on the mountain laying a plaque and paying their respects. I'm very close with all of my family. We'd had no words or no conflict up to that point at all. And you know, we deserved to be there, as did my mother. Um, as did my sister Vicky, uh, none of whom knew that this special service was going on. That's probably the tipping point for me when I thought, There's, something's not right here. The family is divided over the mystery of David's disappearance. Did he meet with foul play? as Stephen and Paul believe? Or did he just lose his bearings, as Janine and Peter believe? You have their side, David's gone up there and died with a smile on his face, looking at the majestic Mount Buller and all that sort of stuff underneath the tree, and one day we'll find him um, leaning up against that tree sort of thing. That's what they wanted everyone to think. The village idiot would know that that's not true. And the sisters don't see the brothers and, you know, that's a pretty sad outcome. They had a great relationship, but it's now broken because they all have different beliefs of what happened. David's gun's never been found. His orange beanie's never been found because they all wear orange beanies. His Kevlar boots have never been found. You know, did he die? Did he leave? Was he shot? Next, Adam retraces the missteps in the police investigation. All of the forensic evidence, any hair or blood that might have been in the car, all just got lost. In 2011, David Prideaux disappeared in the Victorian high country, and not a trace of him has been found. The last person to report seeing David alive was his hunting buddy and brother-in-law, Rob Dale. One of the 
of the theories that was pushed around a lot was Rob Dale might have accidentally shot David and then freaked out and tried to hide the body. There's no suggestion that Rob Dale was involved in David Prideau's disappearance. But I wanted to talk to Julian Morgans, the only journalist to interview Rob Dale since David went missing. He was stomping around in a paddock in gumboots and he saw me, he saw me just hanging around his driveway and he came over and he's like, hey, mate, what are you doing? I was like, oh, look, I'm a journalist, you know, can we have a chat? And he thought about it for a moment and said, oh, yeah, all right, come on in. I, I said, be honest with me, did you accidentally or deliberately kill David and, and hide his body? And uh, Rob Dale said, no. I had nothing to do with the disappearance of David Prido. And he said in a way like he'd been waiting for it. He kind of waited for me to say that. Alex, there are still some people who say that this could have been an accidental shooting. And what they put forward is this scenario where it takes nine hours for Robbie Dale to contact the police. Look, it, it, it may occur from time to time, but in most cases, accidental or unintentional shootings are very, very rare. In this scenario, I don't think it's very likely. In his 2011 statement to police, Rob Dale said he heard the sound of two trail bike riders in the vicinity of Buckland Spur on the morning that he and David went their separate ways on the mountain. So as far as we know, those two trail bike riders have never been spoken to? To my knowledge, no. What I would like to know is, if someone went past the hut during that day, David Tower was it parked there. Could have been used to transport a dead body to another location. At what point was David's car searched forensically? It wasn't. It wasn't? No. One of several mistakes made in the first few days was that they broke open the four-wheel drive and used it to ferry searches and, and police up and down the mountain. So all of the fingerprints, all of the forensic evidence, any hair or blood that might have been in the car, all just got lost. There was another potential oversight. When police arrived here on the evening of June 5, there was no suspicion that a crime had been committed. So they asked Rob Dale to fire his gun in the air hoping that David Prideau would hear and fire his gun back in response. Once Dale had done that, police could not conduct a gunshot residue on his rifle, which would have helped them eliminate Rob Dale as a potential suspect in any foul play. They didn't have guns, the coppers? Yeah, I'm pretty sure they would have, and they uh, had pretty loud sirens and, and all sorts of things as well. It just struck me as odd, but uh, yeah, look, I don't know procedure, whether that's proper procedure or not. It just doesn't add up as what you would do. So when you come on a scene like this where someone's saying, my mate's missing, would you, as a precaution, do a gunshot residue test? The operations commander's role is to establish exactly what's, what's the best chance he's got of finding that missing person based on the evidence that he's got. So he needs to work out who, what, when, where and how and then plan forward to try to find the person as soon as possible to preserve life. People blame Robbie, you know? I don't know whether it's his fault. As far as I'm concerned, Robbie was a nice bloke. He's got a very sort of open, almost childlike face. So there's, there's something about his face that, that uh, really in, instills trust. So I really liked him actually. But then I said, why should I believe you? And, and he said, you should believe me because I'm always honest. He said, I took my wife from another man. And when that happened all those years ago, I went to this guy and said, hey, I'm, I'm gonna be going out with your wife now. And I know this is gonna be hard for you, but it's important to be honest. So he was willing to sort of give away a kind of embarrassing personal secret in a way to, to demonstrate his authenticity. And I thought that was compelling. Victoria Police never thought Rob Dale 
was involved in the disappearance of David Prudeau and didn't pursue that line of inquiry. Australian Crime Stories makes no suggestion that Dale was in any way involved in his brother-in-law's disappearance. Next. That was the end of any chance of reconciling with that side of the family, wasn't it? I've finished. The meeting that pushed the family over the edge. Never had a conversation from that point forward. Prison boss David Prudeau has officially been declared dead more than three years after vanishing in the Victorian Alps. Foul play has been ruled out, with a coroner finding he wasn't murdered, but died from an accident or medical condition. I got a phone call from uh, someone I think was at Channel 9 asking for a response from the family regarding the coroner's findings into the disappearance of my brother. What did you say? Uh, I said I had no knowledge there even was a coroner's inquest. Could I please get your name and number? Um, and I'll come back to you pretty quickly. None of our family were made aware that the coroner's inquest had actually been held. And this is despite me registering formally with the coroner's court through their proper process of being an interested party in the inquest. It didn't sit well with me for my own mother to have not known that an inquest was being held into the disappearance of her son. It didn't resonate as proper process. It just, it didn't add up. It took Stephen two years of agitating to receive a copy of the coroner's report. which found that foul play was not involved in David's disappearance. What I thought was most interesting about that was not who statements were taken from, but who statements weren't taken from. There was no statements of dissent. You know, I, I don't think that happened. I think this might have happened and those sorts of things. It, it, it could have only led the, the coroner down, down one pathway. Stephen was far from satisfied with the handling of the case. In 2017, he applied for access to confidential files on the investigation. When the police response came, it was modest to say the least. I was simply provided with uh, copies of two press releases the Victorian police issued. One basically saying a search has commenced and one basically saying that a search has come to an end. It took them four months to find press releases they'd actually issued before. Yeah, correct. It just adds to that, yeah, something's not right here. You know, who, who is obstructing, you know, us in our journey to, uh, to find the truth? Stephen was trying to reunite his divided family. He hadn't spoken to his sister Janine and brother Peter for a long time. In 2012, he organised a meeting in Seymour. He called on volunteers willing to return to the high country to look for David. As soon as David's wife Joanne found out about the new search, she contacted Stephen. I received a telephone call from her, I think the day before. Uh, saying, I understand you're organising a large-scale search. And uh, I said, yes. And she said, you know, I, I direct you to stop it. And I said, why? We always said we were going to go back and search. The timing's not right. My children are vulnerable. Um, this, this is not the right thing. Joanne probably didn't want Georgia or Caleb, her and David's kids, exposed to any more media or pressure. It would have been tough because they're both bright kids and Caleb in particular was David's pride and joy. He was just fabulous. Anyone would love him as a son. So Joanne was trying to protect him in that way and I respect that, but all she had to do was say, kids, I don't want you watching the news, but something's going on, we must do this. Stephen and Paul ignored Joanne's requests and went ahead with the meeting, which attracted 
150 volunteers. Joanne did come into the meeting and she did um, take the chair and she asked everyone to basically go home, mind your own bloody business sort of thing and um, boot off. That was pretty much the end of any chance of reconciling with that side of the family, wasn't it? I oh, finished. Never had a conversation from that point forward. It turns out Joanne had a reason to be angry with her husband. In the months after he went missing, she found out from police that David had been unfaithful. There's an old saying that if you go missing, make sure your affairs are in order. In David's case, it came out that there were other women. I heard those rumours, but do you believe them? David's not that type of bloke, the David that, you know, I grew up with. So, you know, I don't believe those, those rumours. They're actually true. No, they? That's pretty sad. So you can now see the impact on Joe. Well, you can understand why that would drive the division in her side of the family from them and not want to be around them. One of David's girlfriends lived in Broome in Western Australia. Leading to speculation, he might have staged his own disappearance and gone to live with her. There were a number of alleged sightings of David in the months after his disappearance. However, it all came to nothing. That was never a realistic consideration. He had so many things to walk away from that he wouldn't walk away from. No matter how bad things might have been privately in his own life. Which brings us to the murder theory. If David Prado was murdered, why and by whom? Brothers Stephen and Paul have been doing their own investigations. I've had a lot of help from decent cops and I've had them tell me, you know he was murdered, we know it. Every cop in Victoria, there's 15,000 of us that know your brother was murdered. But the brass upstairs just won't admit it. When we return... There's been speculation Mr Prado's role with the Corrections Department and the Carl Williams investigation may have had something to do with his disappearance. It was sad that David Prado's family fell apart after he vanished in the high country. Growing up, they'd been as tight a family as you could ever meet. That family loyalty had been tested, though, in the late 1980s, and Paul Prudeau was sentenced to five years' jail on two counts of armed robbery. You were in Pentridge and your brother was a screw? Yes. How did that go? Well, it went OK, because back in those days, we were still a good group. I used to dag him about it because, you know, shit job, you know, key rattler, peering up assholes, counting heads, one, two, three, ringing bells, all that bullshit. But he was happy and I was happy that David was what he was. David continued working in prison administration. And by 2011, he was the general manager of Victoria's toughest prison, Barwon. He was aware of all aspects of incarceration and what it can do to you and what it can do to family. David McCulloch was imprisoned at Barwon for 13 years after being convicted on drug trafficking charges. Prior to his incarceration, he knew David Prado socially. David was the coach of my grandson's footy team, so I'd see David at the footy grounds and would chat to him. And when I was taken into Barwon in 2005, he came down from his office and said, don't worry about the young fella, I'll pick him up, take him to training and drop him back off. That's when I knew this guy 
was, was just a more than decent guy. He had a holistic approach. He wanted to help guys that were incarcerated. Under David Prado's leadership, there were groundbreaking initiatives inside the walls at Barwon. He built a multi-faith chapel, encouraged inmates to prepare food for the homeless, and he ran Indigenous, ethnic and charity events where staff worked alongside the inmates. He instilled in the guys a sense of, you can still hold your head up high while you're in here and feel good about yourself and I'm going to help you do that and his staff did that too. But it wasn't all good news. At the height of the Melbourne gangland wars, Barwon Prison was, for some inmates, a very different environment. A pressure cooker where warring crime bosses were encouraged to inform on each other to help Victoria Police solve cases. Barwon was used under instruction. Barwon had no choice. They were told what to do. So David had to fall in line with that. He would have had no choice. Tonight, feared gangland killer and drug runner Carl Williams is dead. Murdered in a prison hailed as Victoria's most secure. At about 12.48 p.m. this afternoon, Carl Williams was seated at a table. One of the other inmates struck him to the head a number of times with a heavy instrument. Carl Williams was killed by another inmate, Matthew Johnson. He told police that Williams had it coming as he'd become an informer, breaking an unspoken prison code. That code was broken when Johnson became aware that Williams was helping police over the murders of police informant Terence Hodson and his wife, Christine. When he was killed, Carl Williams was due to give evidence against former police officer Paul Dale over the Hodson murders. Some believe that Prudhoe not only discussed the case with Williams, but had copies of statements made by Williams stored on CD-ROMs. Those CDs were allegedly in Prudhoe's Land Cruiser at the time he went missing. All of Carl's statements and discussions with police were recorded on that. So we had the very same material that got Carl Williams killed was in David's car? Yes. At what point was that discovered? Well, it wasn't discovered in the car at all because police are denying it ever existed. There's been speculation Mr Prideau's role with the Corrections Department and the Carl Williams investigation may have had something to do with his disappearance, but police have dismissed the claim. Yeah, I asked David's wife, Joanna Bella, uh, she just scoffed. She just said, this bloody CD I keep hearing about, never seen it, I never saw it, it didn't exist, the whole thing was just a rumour. I didn't persist with it much further. I've seen documents that confirm that at least one disc made by Williams was copied and passed around by prisoners in Williams' unit in Barwon Jail before his death. And that material was presented to David Prideau. That sort of information would fuel that aspect, but I got on well with more than just Dave in the hi hierarchy in there. And that was common practice for general managers to take material home to look at over the weekend. There was all sorts of rumours going on, but you made your own investigation with others? Definitely with the influence of those much more influential and significant than myself and those outside associated with those significant individuals. Yeah, there was no stone left unturned. And it was certainly decreed that it was not a criminal action in terms of gangland stuff. Next. I know that they know the truth. They know that David was murdered. If there's nothing to see here, 
they're not at risk of putting up a million dollar reward for information, are they? We've discussed a range of possibilities regarding the 2011 disappearance of prison boss David Prideaux. Nothing I've seen as yet disproves the Victorian coroner's finding that David died of natural causes, either from an accident or a medical episode. David had come down to see me in my unit on the Friday. He was quite weary looking and he'd put on a wee bit of weight. And I said, I said, are you training? He said, not as much. I said, we better get back to running. He says, well, well I'm going on a hunting trip, so uh, I'll, I'll be getting a bit of exercise this weekend. So that was it. He was tired, yeah. Acting director of Corrections Victoria. Pretty tough gig, I would think. What's your theory then, what happened to Dave? I think David had a heart attack. I think Dave's in a very deep ravine. I do believe that. What about all the other stuff he had with him? He had his rifle, he had his radio, he had brand new camouflage gear, orange beanie. You would have thought something would have been found by now. Well, the thing is, you need to understand, things can disappear into this country very, very easily and very, very quickly. You fall over in a gully 30 or 40 metres away, and you could be wearing a Father Christmas suit. Nobody's going to see you. By the time the natural actions of the microbes and the water and the snow take its toll, it doesn't matter what you're wearing, you're going to disappear. With no trace of David, his gun or equipment ever being recovered, the official finding is also just a theory. At the end of all this investigation, all these years, no possibility jumps up as more possible than the rest of them. No, that's right. There is an unlikely explanation here that is the correct one, but we haven't found it because it's unlikely. Stephen said to me at one point, we were over the campfire, and he said, look, I, I kind of hate this place. I'm going to hate it. He said, I come up here every year, and it's muddy, and it's cold. Yeah. This place should be on the map. It should be just like dragons be here. What's your feeling about what's happened? Having spent a lot of time in the, in the region, talked to a lot of hunters there who traversed every quarter, every valley, every ridge. He could not have walked far enough out of an area that hadn't been comprehensively searched. He's clearly not there. I was up there for sometimes a week at a time over a period of years. He wasn't lost there at all. He would have been recovered by now, or part of him or part of his property by now. All I was ever told by people that I know, did know and would know, your brother's gone, he's not coming back, don't ask questions, get over it. I know that they know the truth. They know that David was murdered. They don't want it known. I was a bit of the glue in that family for a long time. I was very, very close to everybody. I'd never had falling out uh, with anyone, but I, I was quickly alienated early in this journey over my decision to, you know, side with Paul and not accept the official narrative and to uh, keep rattling cages, I, I guess. Um, if there's nothing to see here and David's just genuinely fallen over and had a heart attack, they're not at risk of putting up a million dollar reward for information, are they? This wild country has given no clue to David Prudeau's fate. Personally, 
I have a strong feeling this mystery will one day be solved. And David's loved ones will have an answer that could help restore this divided clan. In the meantime, the search will continue for the piece of evidence that reveals just what happened on that hunting trip in the Victorian high country. If we can find one clue, we'll give them closure, um, I'd be so happy for them. They're all a wonderful bunch of people, but you know, sometimes rifts just go too far and they're irreversible. You can see it growing, especially after the, the Prito's mother passed away. There's no funeral. The people don't want to get together to be with each other to you know, celebrate their mother's life. That's a tragedy. It's, it is a tragedy. What do you want to happen from here? Oh, look, ideally, I'd like the reinvestigation into the, uh, into the case. Yeah, as time goes by, loyalties fall apart, you know, relationships break down. Um, there's people out there who know more than we know. And, uh, you know, I'd, I'd just love them to come forward. He was a great father, one of my best mates. I'll always miss him. Everyone would tell you David was a thoroughly decent human being and a very, very good person. That's what really drives me. So if somebody does know something, this is closure for, uh, for our family. There's closure for David's children. And it's the opportunity to, you know, uh, bury him somewhere and, uh, and allow everyone to get on with their life.